We've got a majority. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you all. I'm going to kick this meeting off and welcome you to the first meeting in 2024 of the illustrious Threshold Update Initiative Stakeholder Working Group. Um, so welcome. We have one new member, uh, Director Settlemeyer um, from the state of Nevada is our new member. I don't know if Director, you wanna say a word? I appreciate the opportunity to be on this prestigious group. Uh, James Settlemeyer, Director of the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, uh, formerly I did a lot of work within the TRPA when I was in the legislature. I look forward to this important subject of trying to make sure we keep certain problems out of the lake and out of the basin. Thank you. And we appreciate your service on this committee. Um, as the director said, that is the goal of this committee um, to address the and update of the threshold standards, which are the overall goals of both the agency and the partnership at large uh, for Tahoe. Um, so with that, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, can those of you online see the shared screen now? Yep. Yep. Excellent. Um, so I'll get started. Um, quick run through of today's agenda. Um, so we've determined that we have a quorum. I want to ask you each to name yourself. I will note that this meeting is being recorded, as is our custom. Um, and will be posted online. Um, so please keep that in mind. Um, we have, this is our first meeting since October of 2022. Um, and the primary purpose of this meeting um, is to address questions that were raised during an update given to the Advisory Planning Commission on the proposed updates to the threshold standards. Um, so for those of you who, um, Remember the origins of this committee. So this committee started um, as a committee chartered or requested by the governing board and then chartered by the advisory planning commission um, that would do initial vetting and provide guidance and do a deep dive into the review of the threshold standards and its update. So that's the overall uh, mandate and scope of the purview of this committee. Um, I don't know if anyone or everyone had an opportunity to look at the up or the October meeting summary or meeting minutes, um, I would like to now ask if anyone has any updates or suggested updates to that or corrections um, to those. Head nods, no in the room online. Um, I don't have any amendments. Um, I was trying to recall back to October of 2022. But I think I think it's a pretty good summary and it actually did help refresh my memory for some of the discussion we'll have today because we talked about AIS back then. Yep. Um, and I apologize, apologize that it's been such a long gap. Um, but with that, we'll, we'll consider those notes um, adopted or that meeting summary adopted and we'll move on to the heart of our meeting today. Um, so, as I mentioned, we presented uh, a suite of proposed threshold standards to the Advisory Planning Commission um, at their October meeting, and there were four thresholds or four proposed standards in that package, two related to aquatic invasive species within our region, uh, one related to stream environment zones, that's the basin's unique term for wetlands and meadows, um, and one related to TYC or Tahoe Yellowcrest. Um, and at that uh, commission hearing, there was a robust discussion around the two AIS threshold standards. There was less um, interest or there was more general support for the stream environment zone standard and the TYZ, TYC standard. Um, but there was questions related to the two AIS ones and that's the scope of our meeting today. Um, so I'll go into first like what those questions were um, and then how we are proposing um, to resolve those questions. Um, so the two uh, questions that really arose um, at the Advisory Planning Commission discussion can be simplified into two broad categories. Um, so the first related to 
the two standards that were proposed, um, which both related to aquatic invasive plants. Um, and the commission wanted greater discussion and explanation for why we weren't proposing uh, standards for other aquatic invasive species. Um, so you'll recall this discussion is just on the heels of the discovery of New Zealand mud snails within the region. Um, and there was some discussion around why weren't we proposing a threshold standard for mud snails as well? Or what about aquatic invasive fish? What about Asian clams? Um, so that was the first question. The second question related to the target date for attainment of the threshold standards within the Keys, um, which as you can read on the screen was proposed to be achieved by 2045. And the committee wanted more discussion on if that was an appropriate date for a threshold standard. Um, so we're gonna take these questions one at a time um, and work through it that way. Um, so first, why plants and not other AIS? Um, and to give you a, a sort of brief history of how we arrived at that, um, I wanted to provide a little bit of background on the work of this committee um, and the work of the overall update initiative process, because um, we've been at this for just about 10 years now. Um, so this is, some of you may be disheartened by that timeline and I apologize. Really? Um, really that long? It, it has been near, almost that long. So I'm tracing the origins back to the, the, yeah, the 2015 threshold evaluation. Um, so the threshold evaluation is our uh, every four year check into how we're doing with our threshold standards. And the 2015 threshold evaluation was peer reviewed um, by a suite of external experts. And in their broad summary, um, I think we, we summarized it like this at the time to our board. Basically, the, the reviewers called for a broad re-examination of what the threshold standards were and a re-examination of how we were monitoring progress towards those and the overall system that allowed us to speak to the effectiveness of our programs and policies and their relations to the threshold standards. And they basically said, do all of this, but start with the standards themselves, because we're concerned that the vast majority of your standards date back over 40 years. Um, so that led us to seek um, the support of the Tahoe Science Advisory Council, um, which did its initial engagement with the Threshold Update Initiative um, in 2017, when we asked it sort of a broad question, which was, can you survey the landscape of natural resource program management and provide us broad guidance for how we should articulate threshold standards and how we should organize the system of information that allows us to manage those? Um, so they reviewed um, how 11 different systems did that and provided us um, some guidance within this document. And that document really, so 2017 is actually when we formally kicked off this process on the heels of that. Um, and one of the things that the Science Advisory Council um, said, maybe in gentler and kinder words than this, was your current threshold standards are really a mishmash of a lot of different things. Um, and he, the threshold standards themselves at the time were actually identified as such. So we had three different types of threshold standards within our, this, our system. So we had things which we called numerical standards, which actually had a numerical target. So these are what most people think about as a threshold standard. Then we had things that we called uh, management standards, which were also th threshold standards, which were really um, a, a direction to adopt a best practice to work towards a broader goal. So this is things like reduce pollutant loading in order to achieve your other goals. And then finally, we had policy statements, um, which at the time that the threshold standards were adopted um, were guidance from the threshold standard uh, study group to the agency to incorporate things within the regional plan. Um, and so basically the Science Council identified like, look, you've got this broad mix of things that you call threshold standards. And what we really need to do before we start to update these in earnest is we actually need to 
sort out where everything belongs in your system. Um, and th this was just an excerpt from that report talking about the policy statements in particular um, and the corrosive influence of those as threshold standards um, and the need to address um, these broad policy statements um, and basically move them to another part of the system because they were overall um, bringing down the efficacy of the system at large. And so we needed to address that by not just having these broad aspirational statements that people could disagree about. We needed to act actually articulate our goals in specific and measurable ways that could be objectively evaluated. So that there's no agreement about whether or not the agency and the region as a whole is making progress towards its goals or if it's making enough progress towards its goals. Um, and so what the, the Science Council suggested was that basically we, sh we should look at everything within our system um, and look at the role that it serves. And they suggested an initial lens of breaking things down between goals, which are these broad aspirational statements um, that express purpose, um, objectives, which are a detailed explanation of that purpose, um, strategies, um, which are an overall way um, to achieve your goal or objective, and then tactics finally, which are specific things um, that we're doing. Um, so to give you a, goal, a, a sort of explanation or an example, it's completely outside of what we're talking about. Um, you could say a goal is to save the whales. And that's what you explain to a lay person that you're trying to do. And the Science Council said, basically, that's not enough for a threshold standard. You actually need it to be specific and measurable. So we turn that goal, save the whales, into I want a thousand populations, a thousand populations of naturally breeding whales in the wild. So now we've formalized it to something that we can count. And we can all look at you know, the metric sheet at the end of the day and say, do we have a thousand populations? Yes or no, are we achieving our goal? Um, then you go to strategy. So how are we gonna achieve that goal? So you may say the biggest threat to whales is being struck by large shipping um, sh boats. And so we are going to reduce boat strikes on whales. And then ultimately the tactics or how we do that is we're gonna put more speed limit signs in the ocean. Obviously these are just rough ideas that are illustrative of how you might do this. The reports are littered with examples from our region as is the graphic on the screen. But that's the whole idea. It's basically Science Council said, in order to be more effective, you need to separate out all of these things. Um, and both we as an agency and um, the Tahoe Interagency Executive Steering Committee, um, which is the uh, interagency committee that oversees the EIP, agreed that what we were going to do um, is we were gonna sort all the things within our system now into two broad bins. Um, we were, are going to, and those would be the EIP performance measures, which are the inputs. So these are all the things that we do. These are, in this example, like the miles of street that we sweep, those are gonna be EIP performance measures. The direct outputs of those which is reducing fine sediment, nutrient load um, that's reaching the lake, is going to be the quantifiable output of the, our actions. Those are also going to be EIP performance measures. Um, and then ultimately, what we're all working towards um, is the threshold standards, and that's the overall goal. So in the example on the screen right now, um, the overall clarity of the lake becomes our goal within this system. And everything else is moved over into the EIP performance measure category. So these are all, this is still background on where we were in the past. Um, and th this slide I borrowed from a Science Council presentation uh, to this group six years ago. Um, and basically they said the overall goal of this is to gain knowledge on how to manage our system better. So 
basically what they said is you've got a lot of data and information floating around right now. And what you need to do is organize that in a better way to gain knowledge, to actually improve management within our region and accelerate threshold standard attainment. So ultimately that's our goal of reorganizing this system. So what many of you may remember as part of this review about where things um, live in the, the this overall system was there was a long discussion in the, the science council report and then afterwards in our meeting on the AIS standards. Um, because the existing AIS standards, they identified as all goals. And goals, you remember, are these aspirational statements of intent um, that can't be objectively evaluated. So here again, if you look at our existing AIS standards, there are things like reduce the ecological impacts of aquatic invasive species, reduce the social impacts, reduce the distribution. What's wrong? Storm is probably an hour. Okay, so. Someone's online, could you please mute? So you're talking. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the, the AIS standards were called out specifically here. So we've had a lot of conversation about those. And then we also had a lot of conversation about what exactly are threshold standards. So we've got these definitions in the compacts and guidance from the compacts. The compact defined threshold standard as an environmental standard um, and then relates those to our regional plan by saying that once we adopt these threshold standards, we meet, need to have a plan or the regional plan should be sufficient to achieve and maintain those standards. So they're, they're grounded in the practical reality of what we can do. And ultimately that led us to assess all of our standards based on the SMART criteria. Um, which you'll remember from earlier uh, discussions of this group. And basically we said, we want all of our standards to be specific, measurable. Um, so specific means everyone should, be, should understand them. Measurable means that we should have a reasonable way to measure progress towards them and decide if we're in or out of attainment. Attributable, meaning they should be accomplishable by actions inside our region. Um, relevant means that it should be important from a regional standpoint. Um, and we had broad agreement on the first four of the SMART. Um, the last one, time bound, there was some disagreement about whether the standard should also be time bound. And we ultimately didn't make a decision on that at the time. Um, we adopted the other ones into the thresholds and regional plan, um, which now include those definitions that we should have specific measurable and outcome-based objectives that are relevant to our region. Um, so we made that modification and adopted new guidance for what the threshold standards should include. Um, and ultimately it was looking back at those that led us um, to the recommendation that's before you today. Um, and what we were recommending, so this is in regard to the first question, of why aquatic invasive plants um, and not other species um, at this time. And ultimately we looked at the, um, the AIS action agenda and where we were going in the aquatic invasive plant space. Um, and what we, th what we determined was that we had uh, specific and actionable plans that would allow us to achieve the two threshold standards that were proposed for plants. And thus those were ripe for adoption as threshold standards because they met these three criteria. They were an outcome that we are collectively working towards and they are specific and measurable and that we can measure progress towards them. So what does that mean for the other aquatic invasive species within our system? Um, and what, what that means is that we think they continue to live in the goals and policies of the regional plan. Um, so, we, so the goals and policies of the regional plan 
broadly outline how we are going to achieve our um, threshold standards, but also articulate more than that. They take articulate um, these broad goals, which can serve as aspirational statements um, for what we are trying to achieve, because we don't have to make the same determinations that we do for threshold standards. And those same determinations, meaning is it specific and measurable? Um, we can have broad policy directives um, to engage in a certain type of activity or otherwise. Um, so that's the context for the first recommendation. And I think with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, and ask if there are any questions and open this to a broader discussion around where, what people think about that recommendation. Would anyone online or in the room like to jump in there? So the silence either means that the, it was such a good suggestion that no modifications are necessary, or it was so bad you don't know where to start your comment. Um, I, I would start just by saying I remember the conversation that we had earlier uh, when there were members of the public that were listening to our uh, recommendation to the APC, and many of them were concerned that we weren't doing our job by including all invasive species. So I think that what I'd like to hear from you, Dan, is how would you answer that question at an APC meeting where we're going to propose that we limit it to only plants? I understand the rationale that you've gone through, but I don't quite see how you're gonna answer that question. So maybe this is a good practice session for the APC. Um, I, I think the way that we answer that is that we memorialize our intent um, for things like aquatic invasive species more broadly within the regional plan. And then when we have a specific numeric baseline from which to work from and a goal that we've articulated that is also specific and measurable that we can work towards, that we then adopt it as a threshold standard. And I think that answer also covers things like um, microplastics within the lake, where I think you know we are in a similar situation as both states are in right now, where we're still in the information gathering stage in terms uh, that is a preamble to formal standard setting. And you actually need more information to set a standard for the protection of human and or ecological health than we have at this time. Um, so, and where we have that situation where we are still gathering that information and don't want to just adopt an aspirational um, statement as a threshold standard, we adopt those aspirations to memorialize that intent within the regional plan. Susan, did you want to respond before I jump to Jennifer? Uh, no, I understand where you're coming from. I just don't know whether or not that would satisfy a member of the public that will be listening to the APC meeting. Um, but uh, yeah, let's go to Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer, please. Yeah, so um, I'm I'm recalling some of that same discussion, and I was uh, right last half hour or so before the meeting, I was reviewing the minutes from that October APC meeting and. It was a really good discussion um, with a lot of members' comments as well, um, talking about you know all invasive species and even the challenges with making it that comprehensive because even kokanee salmon are an invasive species, right? We don't necessarily want to eradicate those, right? So um, you know, breaking it down to things that we can handle now as thresholds is good, but where do we put some of those other aspirational statements? Maybe in the more near term, because amending the regional plan is not a fast or easy process. So are there other places maybe in the code of ordinances or something where we could put 
some of the more loftier goals about the other species, about, you know, studies that are needed in order to develop a threshold for snails or clams or um, warm water giant goldfish or, um, you know, other things along those lines or other plant species outside the basin. Because right now we're also just talking about reducing aquatic invasive plants in the Tahoe Keys. Um, but there's a lot of other AIS plant stuff going on um, that's not in that threshold standard for reducing abundance in keys by 20 by 75 percent so you know part of like I said part of the discussion was like okay where where do we memorialize the concerns along the lines of what Susan was saying where do we where do we put these other things that we know we need to work on so that they don't appear to be being ignored and maybe the ordinances are the fastest spot to put them for now until we could do more of a regional plan update Maybe before John Hester jumps in, I just want to clarify, we there are two proposed standards for aquatic invasive plants, one inside the Tahoe Keys and a separate one outside the Tahoe Keys. So collect, it is comprehensive with regard to plants. Um, I'll go to John Hester. Hey, Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> I, Dan and I spent a lot of time on that question and kind of limited what we were bringing to Tui Sweet today, and maybe we shouldn't have done that, but the first place I went was, look, we have threshold standards, we have regional plan goals and policies, we have standards in our codes of ordinance, code of ordinance which are different than the standards that are in the thresholds, and we have performance measures, and we have project conditions, and we have environmental improvement project priorities. We, we ended up with a list of nine, I think it was nine different functions that DRPA performs that these things could fit. Each, each thing you could look at and say, where does it fit in one of those nine slots? And um, I don't remember them all, but I remember we got to the point where we had a checklist that said, Dan yeah, developed the checklist is if you hit all six of these, it probably belongs here. If you hit these, it belongs there. And maybe that's that's a lot, and it's kind of conceptual and, and, and kind of geeky, maybe, nerdy. But maybe that's something we should include in the packet that we bring back to the ABC so you can see that we thought about the broader question about where do these things go, because they have to go somewhere. Um, so I mean, I'll throw that out as something for the group to respond to. Dennis, can I go to you? I don't know if it's an immediate response to John's. Not necessarily immediate. Well, sort of. Um, I can comment on the other species uh, aspects as well, but as far as where do we capture those things if we're not capturing them in the threshold, we also have a federally and state approved management plan where we capture those uh, goals for other species, oh, any aquatic oh. species. Thank you. Director Sotomayor. What about the thought of just referencing that within the Compact 2I, it is important that we manage the air, water, soil, vegetation, and noise aspects of the lake. But at this time, we only have enough, we're focusing or we have enough data to go more into the concept of water in the form of trying to prevent invasive species in that respect. So in other words, reference the compact and then give our findings based upon that. That way it tells everyone we're not ignoring our requirement or our mandates to look at the air, water, soil, vegetation, and noise as compact indicates in 2i. But at this point, the most prevalent thing we're trying to address is the water quality in the form of keeping out the invasive species. Just a thought. That kind of fits with what we're talking about. That, that kind of fits with what we were talking about. No, I'm not talking. Sorry. I thought I was still in the APC meeting talking to the L. That kind of fits with the same thing 
we were just talking about is like we can't look at every everything in detail mm -hmm. so let's put these others in a more generic categories or something yep. and i guess then maybe to, to fine tune the point and bring it to uh, what jennifer said is what's the appropriate place for those that aren't thresholds now mm -hmm. is it within the code of ordinance and is it faster to amend those or is it more appropriate within the regional plan um, to memorialize that intent? John Marshall can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the the requirements for adopting an amendment to the threshold are the same as they are for the regional plan and the same as they are for the community ordinances. Is anything wrong, John? Uh, they're generally very close. Um, you know, generally those kind of uh, goals and policies belong in the regional plan. Uh, or, you know, Dennis's suggestion of um, this federally mandated management plan. Um, but they're, you know, that that's where you want to put your, you know, goals, uh, if you're, you know, your overall arching goal is, you know, to uh, protect from invasive species. Um, so that's, that's where I would tend to advise to place, you know, very large overarching goals. So is that, that's a recommendation to put it within the goals and policies and then reference the AIS management plan there? Um, if you, you can, if you want, but I, I'm not making a recommendation as to actually put it there. Oh. I'm just saying if one was going to do it, that's the place for that kind of, um, kind of large objective, high level objective. And I think those categories are the same that Director Settlemeyer was talking about. In the regional plan, you've got a broad framework with a lot of categories where you could say this is a general water quality approach. We're going to do these. Here's our goal and here's our policies without having to meet all the criteria, the SMART criteria for a threshold. Doesn't mean that the SMART criteria, that the threshold doesn't sit above the regional plan goals and policies, but it means that we don't have enough specifics to take a goal and policy and, you know, make it a SMART threshold. Dan, can I come on on this as well? Laura. Um, yeah, I mean, I know we've talked about this kind of in in smaller groups as well, but in terms of AIS that I would potentially be concerned with ensuring that we have a threshold standard for, I think the ones where we have some baseline information, like Asian clams as an example, or potentially New Zealand mud snails where they rise not to the non-native, but to the invasive bar, so to speak. I could potentially see that um, being appropriate to still be included in thresholds. That being said, I could probably be swayed in, in another way if they were more spelled out in sort of a similar fashion that is, you know, more specific, measurable, and outcome-based within the AIS management plan. Um, for those specific species of concern, I just do, I do think that they need to be addressed in some regard to satiate kind of the needs of the public and the needs of APC that were were expressed in that in that meeting in some meaningful way. If I could build upon that comment, um, you know, we have a bunch of action plans for different EIP categories that very important they aren't adopted in the code and they aren't adopted in the regional plan and they aren't adopted as thresholds but we still use them to prioritize what we do with the, in the environmental improvement program so maybe that is a you know maybe dennis is that's the way dennis what dennis suggested could manifest itself that way jennifer your your summary at the beginning was super helpful um I think for everyone, but also for Director Settlemeyer because he hasn't been involved for these years. But the one piece that we didn't talk about was how we had started with what, a hundred and some thresholds and we cleaned them up and through the process that you described and got it down to what was it, 78 or something like that. 
No, um, we're still 148, but down from 170 some. Okay, <laughs> my numbers are off, but all right. So 170 some down to what'd you say? 148. 148. And a fraction of those are water related and a fraction of those are AIS related. So we're in this subset of a subset. Um, but, um, and all that work is really good. And um, while the goal is to not have necessarily more thresholds because more is better, <laughs> um, figuring out what we could or should be doing with some of these other species, um, you know, and, and being able to clearly articulate that to folks. It's like, yes, we're working on Asian clam, you know, metrics or whatever, and it's in this action plan. Um, and someday we may get to a threshold when we have enough data to create a smart metric, um, but we're not there yet, but we're getting there because that was a lot of what the APC members express is like, okay, if not now, when, right? And how, and who's doing it? Um, and so a crosswalk of sorts, much like we did for the, the threshold cleanup where we said, okay, this is where they all started and this is where they ended up. And these ones got combined and this one, you know, moved somewhere else. You know, that's, you sort of mentioned maybe a checklist or something along those lines. It says, okay, yeah, we recognize these AIS issues. There's a lot of them. And these are the different places where they are happening and be able to convey that clearly uh, to the APC and the public as to, um, you know, giving them the confidence that they're not being forgotten or ignored. And like I said, maybe that does, that that strategy alone might keep us from having to put statements in a regional plan update or a, um, or an ordinance or something um, as a placeholder until these things get established. But it's a clear recognition of what is what all the hard work that really is being done that nobody sees on a day to day basis, right? Yeah, I just to build on that, I think the challenge that we're talking about here is really just a re education about what a threshold is and, and how it's used by the organization. And I agree, your summary was nice up front. What was missing or what, what was perhaps glossed over was the whole structure element where the governing board adopted a whole set of like, this is the structure by which how we will move forward. And that structure to me is what establishes a lot of what you're saying with respect to what is and isn't a threshold and what was agreed upon by the collective for the threshold structure that yeah, I'm, I, I don't. I, I appreciate that that education is perhaps not going to sway everyone, but the fact is is that um, their thresholds are are very specific thing, and I think that trying to um, make sure we're all on the same page, both the public as well as the decision makers, about what it is and what it isn't, leads us to this conclusion that you have with respect to plants and other AIS, um, and so I think that that's the trick right now. I. I to me, the foundation is super strong. It's really just a lack of understanding and uh, and consistency regarding what folks think a threshold is and is not. Well, I was gonna say, I think this is aligning with where Bob is coming from, but um, I was really thinking about Jennifer's comment is, if we've got the structure and I don't know if this is the same structure Bob was talking about, but we've got this structure that's thresholds and there's criteria for what they are and roles and policies and so forth. And we be educated about that. I think we also need to build in some way that when we tweak one of them, we look at the other categories. So we said, we're gonna change this action plan or this goal and policy or this threshold standard or this something in the code of ordinances, we make sure that we look at the other parts of that structure to make sure we keep consistency and we don't have things, you know, like say a standard in the code of ordinance get inconsistent with an action plan or something like that. I think we need to, so that, that way that framework that Jennifer was talking about which shows where everything goes, stays updated, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And all going back to the regional plan as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And I think looping back to, to Bob's comment in terms of the the overall structure that we adopted is correct or is is solid. I think the proposal for the thresholds themselves is, I think the unresolved piece that's sort of that discussion today is where did those things live that are in a pre-threshold stage? Because I think, you know, so the, the proposals that were presented to APC worked up through the EIP committees that are developing, you know, the, the AIS action agenda and the TYC work, working group. So they come up from those. And in that AIS memo, you know, they express the intent to develop future threshold standards as species become ripe for them and to continue working on those. And, you know, what I view is, you know, sort of the question from APC and where, you know, Susan started our discussion today is where do we, where does that intent live within our system? Does that live in, you know, the goals and policies of the regional plan? Does it live in the AIS action or the AIS management plan? Or, or does it not, you know, is it outside until it comes in? Because I think that's sort of some of the discomfort that we heard expressed of like, hey, these things are outside, but we are working on them right now. So how can we memorialize that we're working on them and that a standard may be coming in the future when it when it's ripe to do so? so and, uh, and I think along those lines too, at, at starting to document these things, even possibly starting to break down into species specific status is, um, could be helpful too. I mean, we know a lot about Asian clams. We know we know a lot about aquatic weeds, right? We we know a lot, a tremendous amount about aquatic weeds in the Keys. And um, thanks for pointing it out too. The the outside the Keys, where we know there are other um, infestations that are being hand pulled and are essentially eradicated and being under surveillance, or um, you know they're found again and they're hand pulled and those sorts of things. So we we can do a aquatic invasive plants because we know a lot about them, their aerial extent, their um, uh, their abundance and those sorts of things. So, you know, is there a way that we can move forward on some of these other species to memorialize what we know and what we don't know and what we need to know in order to get to a threshold? Because if someone's, you know, clamoring for a threshold over say Asian clams, Okay, we know generally that they're a problem. We know more specifically where they're a problem. We know where we've used the clam bony to get rid of some of them. Um, we pr might even know the um, the acreage of Asian clam infestation. I don't know, but what do we? What still needs to be identified in order to have a smart threshold for Asian clams and or mud snails or whatever? Um, so that we can convey the state of the knowledge and where we need to go still to um, to bridge those gaps and and get to a threshold someday. Does that make sense? Can I ask a question? Can we go to Kat first? Mm -hmm. Kat, you want to jump in? <clears throat> yeah, I was just going to, um, and I might be, you can tell me to stop talking. Um, I, my concern around clams or New Zealand mud snails or some of the other invasives that aren't documented currently in the proposed threshold that's on the table is do, and I, I think this is the question for the group. It's like, do we set a threshold for something we cannot control? If there are no viable control options to get to eradication, do we still set a threshold knowing we will never achieve it? Um, and it, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not saying that we will never achieve those things. I'm just saying right now we know control options for some of those other invasive species are either extremely costly or don't exist yet. And so I'm wondering from a long-term setting of a threshold, what does that look like? And maybe to merge that thought with Jennifer's, Kat is, I mean, maybe what we do is the intent is in the regional plan, but then there's, you know, sort of an, I don't want to call it a checklist because I call everything a checklist, but there is sort of a, a status thing with related to each of those species that says, you know, like we need additional information on extent. We need a viable control method. We need, 
And that, that then becomes the explanation for once you hit all those check boxes on this non-checklist, then you can become a threshold standard. And this is where, you know, you know, this is the group working on that related to this concern. Yeah, and Dennis, I'm sorry before, just to keep, to keep going on this a little bit, because Kat touched on something that is becoming very real, of course, in the um, in the clarity world outside of invasive species. Right now, we have more information than we did when we started the TMDL that where we've been handling it through fine sediment particle removal, right? Now we're like, oh, but we've got these mice of shrimp that have impacted the food web and oh yeah, they're invasive. But then we've got these diatoms that are really acting like fine sediment particles. And and so as Dan was saying earlier and, and John, the, these things are all intertwined. And when you start to mess with one, you have effects on the other. So um, this idea that, um, you yeah. know, is any standard achievable? I mean, and there's a lot of people questioning whether the clarity standard is achievable because of the darn mice of shrimp. So, um, you know, there's, it's hard, it's very hard. Um, but being able to identify what is achievable, I think is still a really good exercise. And I appreciate the point that you made, Kat, that um, some instances we may just, they may not be the technology and or the manpower to actually eradicate something and it is what it is. Dennis, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, you know, in, in regards to the reference to like a checklist, I see it more as like a gap analysis as to what we might need, uh, whether it's a measurable uh, or a way to quantify linear extent densities, uh, things like that, or um, lack of a, a treatment technique, you know, with a lot of, of these invasives, Tahoe is going to be on the leading edge. Uh, no one does really anything other than uh, apply herbicides for aquatic plants uh, or with clams or mud snails, they don't do anything and there's no technique available. So that would be a gap, obviously. Uh, so I think that something like a gap analysis could live within our management plan, certainly, uh, but also the regional plan. I, I'm kind of, I'm going to try to restate this in a more generic way. And it's kind of a question of Jennifer Sykes. And I'm thinking about state legislation Usually the way it works that I understand is there's an issue and then there'll be a, maybe a study or some research, maybe LCB does it, Legislative Council Bureau does it, or maybe one of the departments does it. And then you maybe come up with an action plan. Maybe you come up with, as you move up the hierarchy, maybe you come up with something that goes into the Nevada Administrative Code, you move up, comes into goes into legislation. It seems like, and maybe I didn't characterize that exactly right, but it seems like we have the same thing here. We have something as we've identified it as an issue and maybe it shows up in a management plan or action plan. No, it's gotten to higher than that. It becomes in the code of ordinances and it becomes a goal or a policy. Well, it becomes a threshold that we have enough information and uh, we can be do the SMART criteria. And I'm wondering if there's some analogy or some general hierarchy that we could apply and use that as the framework to say, this issue is to the point it's a threshold. This issue is to the point it's just something we've done an action plan on and we still need to, you know, just something kind of, a framework kind of like that so we can capture these things that are in different states. John, did you just describe the Segan process or is that something else? <laughs> well, it could become the Segan process and we could all go to, Science conferences and present it. <laughs> and, and Call that the process now. No. Maybe Susan, going back to you, do you think that's a better answer to the question in a public forum, or one that you would be more comfortable giving at APC? That says, I mean, I think there's sort of two parts. That is, they are in the regional plan and the goals and policies that we memorialize this intent, and then somewhere else we reference this gap analysis that lists these issues, as well as where we are in the either information gathering phase and or the 
um, development of options to management options phase that would lead to the adoption of a threshold standard? I, I agree with what you're saying, Dan. I think that as long as people know that it's not permanently on a back burner and we just need to explain to them that we are in the position where we don't have enough information to make the standard data-driven. And as soon as we get that information, then we can successfully write it into an attainable threshold. But if with, without the data, you know, it's just a pie in the sky. I should have had you answer your question initially. <laughs> it feels like a setup now. And uh, it wasn't. And we just, went through something sort of similar. We had a AIS retreat with TRPA, Tower Varsity, the League, Forest Service, uh, where we did sort of a gap analysis on some of the needs we have, which ultimately would be helpful for um, showing the need from a funding perspective, because that's certainly a limiting factor for us as well. If we don't have the funds, uh, anything we do for a different priority is going to take away from an existing priority. Uh, so having that available then gives us those tools to show legislators, decision decision makers, funders, et cetera, what the true need is. Um, Laura, then Jennifer. I would just, you know, kind of building on, on what Kat said to begin with to kind of, you know, talk about this. I think, you know, letting the public know that, you know, currently, you know, these AIS being outside of control measures does make it difficult to make it a threshold standard. That being said, I would ask that maybe we would have some sort of timeline in order to be able to revisit these to see if they do meet the bar to become a threshold standard in a time that, you know, maybe we define now so that if it's not a threshold standard today that we're looking at what technologies um, we may be able to deploy in say two, three, four years in order to create a threshold standard if we have that baseline data and information and also ability to control. And I think kind of building on Dennis's point, I do question, you know, what, if anything, are we missing by not including say Asian clams or New Zealand mud snails? Is that is there another place that we drive that for funding? Um, are we missing something by that not being a specific measurable and outcome-based threshold? Um, I think there are other ways to advocate for it as you know, we talked about in that retreat, Dennis, but um, you know, if there is something that we're missing by, by not including that, I, I still think we should revisit the standard. Um, sooner rather than later, maybe not wait 40 years this time. Yeah, I think the okay. gap analysis gives us that opportunity to then start the process to find ways to move the needle uh, when we have an identified need that we can share with others that shade like, hey, this is what we need to, to make progress. And then as far as when do we reevaluate, is it at the time when we do the threshold update? Um, is that every, I, I forget the, the, uh, sequencing of that, but uh, that seems like an appropriate time frame to uh, constantly relook at progress being made towards other species that don't currently have a threshold standard. Uh, Jennifer, again. Jennifer, then John Hester. Muted. There, I was muted. I'll start over. Um, that threshold review is what every four or five years, four years, four years, four years. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say so that is a perfect time to 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 revisit these sorts of discussions and say, okay, what well, what did we do to try to get move the needle on these um, in the interim? Um, and the gap analysis certainly, I, I wholeheartedly um, support the um, the fact that it can identify funding needs to fill those gaps. But, um, you know, with Bob in the room, you know, we're going to bring it back to our friends at the TSAC who um, we love dearly, but if we don't give them things that we need them to do related to the thresholds, they'll go off on their own pet projects that they want funded for their own research and those sorts of things, <laughs> um, which is fine. It's good information for Tahoe, 
But um, I do try to remind them every few years, at least, that um, the TSAC exists in order to help us with these thresholds. And so where we can identify the gap analyses in the gap analyses, like what what we need to know to move the needle and also then what it might cost to move the needle and and do we have funding to move that needle with research through the TSAC or something. And pulling the TSAC back into the loop is a critical piece of it because they're clearly part of the team to answer these questions. You read my mind, Jennifer. I think that the, the challenge, and I think the council is well positioned to, to support these type of analyses. Um, the chat, and I'll, I'll volley back to TRPA and other partners, right? that the, um, the gap analysis of itself is a funding need. I mean, and we talked about this a little bit at the um, AIS retreat and discussion to do that type of uh, work to identify sort of the state of the knowledge, where are we, what, what do we know, what are the control options, and summarize that in such a way that they can inform a threshold process that is a project in of itself to some degree. And so there is a little there is a little bit of activation energy, I think, on that that we need to talk about how to how to overcome. But I do think that the council is well positioned to provide that type of support. Is your point so relevant? Oh, yeah, what, I'm I'm trying to synthesize all this thinking about. <laughs> I've got a synthesis too. ABC. So late. Here we go. So what I'm kind of hearing is, and I, this is, may not be in the right hierarchy, but. If we had a regional plan goal or goals on AIS, we might have a policy that's related to a specific plant or a specific animal that says, and here's, we need to, to revisit the fact that this is just a policy to, to look at this, you know, within say five years or whatever. It's, it's almost like the triggers that we had so much fun with on VMT at the last meeting, but it's sort of like, we're going to look at, uh, can we elevate this to a threshold standard and in the interim do some research or something like that, a policy kind of like that. And then, but I, I think what I heard from the board at our last retreat was they would like performance measures that are more frequent than the threshold update. And so it's almost like if we had a performance report on, if we put a policy in there that says we're gonna do something on Dennis, I know I'll get this wrong, but your Asian milfoil, we're going to do this by this date. Um, we go back as part of our performance report to the board and say, here's what we've done. And following Susan's concept, when we get enough data that we can really drive it to up to the threshold level, then we do that. I don't know if, that, um, I don't know if I'm getting these pieces together correctly or not, but I'm just trying to think of how that we move that forward from here to back to the APC and to the governing board. So th this was my attempt, which I think is very similar to John's. Okay. Um, but it was, so we memorialized the overall intent and a goal and policy of the regional plan. Um, we developed this gap analysis that assesses where the individual work concerns that are not yet threshold standards or don't yet meet the criteria. It shows the public where those live. And then what I jotted down is potentially a code requirement to review that gap analysis with every threshold evaluation and provide a recommendation of does this now rise to the level that we should move it forward as a threshold so that we ensure that process happens every four years. Yeah, I would like to have the ability to make sure we don't have to wait four years. This is just for the does it make meet the threshold? Yeah. Okay. But I, because I think the other, the performance report that you're talking about, and that I think the board mm -hmm. was looking for, is contained in the revised performance measures for the threshold standards, which would be updated every year, and which this group said they didn't want to address as much in the last meeting. Yeah, I, I guess maybe where I'm coming from on the, more often than every four years is those other parts of the framework Jennifer talked about. Oh, should if, we, if we do something there, that ought to show up in the other parts of the framework sooner than every four years. So if we do a code amendment or a regional plan goal or policy amendment or something, we need to look at those other parts simultaneously. Okay, so maybe building off that, maybe it's not a code requirement, that it's 
actually goes in the regional plan goals and policies that says, look at these other parts annually or so. I, I don't know what the right time frame, every two years yeah. and identify when things need to be updated or when something rises to the level of a threshold standard. Yeah, I just, sure. I just, I just, if we get something we need to act on, yeah, I don't want to have to wait four years. I agree. Or if there's a new clam bony. Yeah, yeah, work. yeah. And, and and some of the things we act on may not be thresholds. Bob, you're giving me a funny look. Jennifer. Yeah. So, uh, John, is there a way to memorialize what you're talking about? The more frequently than quadrennially. <laughs> um, where you have an annual work plan, right? That's set by TRPA and endorsed by the board, right? And then you have an annual report as, so if something was ripe for development of a new threshold because we were there, but we were only in year two of the four years, would it be appropriate to put it in the annual work plan um, to you know, set forth the resources necessary through TRPA to to do that work. Is that is that how the annual work plan works? Yeah, but I honestly, I'd like to be more flexible and nimble than that. I'll give sure. you an example. Um, you know, we just adopted the housing amendments, and they give you the option to put in green stormwater infrastructure instead of limiting the size of your, the, the previous coverage, the coverage, because we think that the green stormwater infrastructure is going to be even more effective for water quality than just leaving part of the, more of the site. So that's a threshold, really. Coverage is a threshold. So when we adopt that change in the plan and the code, we ought to say, oh, we need to look at that threshold almost almost simultaneous with taking that action. So we would come to the APC and the governing board and say, okay, here's a here's a plan amendment or a code amendment or whatever, but it also implicates these other things. So we need to change that as well. So it's almost real time. And maybe I'm being a little idealistic, but I think that's that's a way way a more nimble way and a more comprehensive way to address these issues. Not all of them will end up affecting thresholds, but definitely if we're doing something that affects a threshold and we just don't talk about the threshold, that's not good. So, Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And certainly don't want to limit your ability to be nimble um, just with bureaucratic processes on some frequency. But um, when you do a code amendment, you have to do like the, the, the you crosswalk see? to make sure it complies with the regional plan and everything right and so is there is is either in the what the initial environmental checklist or something along those lines i mean is there a place to put a question you know based on this action does the threat does the related threshold need to be revisited that's Where kind that's of a it. Concept, that's a concept we've been talking about is something like that yeah so it forces that thinking into the yeah. culture of trpa when you're doing your work yeah, and then I think at the other end of the spectrum, you know, say we do that as a standard operating procedure, at the other end of the spectrum is if we haven't done anything to deal with this thing that four years ago we thought needed a threshold to be reexamined. Then when the threshold update comes along, we say, oh, we haven't done anything about this threshold. Mm -hmm. Do we want to, do we want to look, even though we haven't changed the plan or code or anything, do we want to look at it? So it's kind of like four years is the longest you wait, but you might do it more often. I don't know if that makes makes sense. I'm, I keep thinking of Susan's question, like, "Holy smoke! I'm sorry I asked this." <laughs> you guys have created this, you know. But maybe, but I don't. Know. I'll stop and let you know, Susan. I'm just thinking. Speak. I'm just thinking. Couldn't that be a function of this committee? Uh, you as the science advisor know when we have enough data available to be able to come up with an appropriate threshold statement. And then it could go through us to go to the APC and then on to the governing board. And the Dan, shaking, Dan shaking. Yeah, sorry, I'm shaking my head in agreement. 
I think that's right. This will be a permanent committee. I teased Dan because he promised me when this thing was set up that it'd be a year, maybe a two-year commitment, and that was many, many years ago. So I think under that concept, is it's good, and I think it may be a, a way to vet some of these things through. But um, yeah, I think uh, if TRPA's uh, on that path, then this committee sounds like it'll be a standing committee uh, for the foreseeable future, which it probably needs to be anyway. Well, we're going to build thresholds back into the system the way they should be. You're right. Yeah. Sorry, Jennifer. Dennis, did you want to jump in? Yeah, um, we also have a more regular process with our AIS coordinating committee where we're talking about long term strategies and objectives uh, and then working through the EIP coordinating committee uh, as a sub working group of tie. So there's that connection there as well as far as how we make progress on uh, or I guess tracking progress on other species that we may not necessarily have a, uh, a fleshed out game plan for. Uh, and one question I have when we're talking about code amendments, um, what does that mean from an AIS control perspective? To my knowledge, we don't have anything currently specific to control. Certainly we have code that um, requires mandatory boat inspections and uh, it's illegal or uh, impermissible to uh, have in possession uh, any aquatic invasives, but I'm not, we don't necessarily have a code for milfoil, for example, that I'm aware of. And I think, so Dennis, I think the, the code amendments we're talking about, it actually, I think it's shifted to a regional plan is more general in nature in terms of how we update this overall structure. Okay. And what I've jotted down that I'd propose is, it seems like we've coalesced around something that says, real time as decisions are made, as new information comes out of the working group and is recommended through the TUI SWIG, or at least every four years, yep. um, we would re revisit this. Yeah, and I Does think, that sound? Oh, yeah, I was gonna say, Dennis, I think, as those one of those three or four steps happen, that's when you'd say, do I need to amend the code of ordinances or not? Do I need to amend the regional plan or not? Do I have a new threshold or not? And it's not going to be the same every time. And we also need to make sure that whenever we're doing something like at the APC, the Thai Steering Committee or the subcommittee of Thai Steering Committee, the you know, working group knows that. So and we're, we're integrating all that. I think the threshold evaluation every four years is a really good opportunity to actually not look at just evaluating the threshold standard itself, but actually to evaluate what what might rise, especially in terms of it specifically. So I think that's a good a good path forward. I think my colleagues at the league would agree with me on that. Dan, what were you uh, saying? You had ongoing and what were your steps? I had so I had three. So to summarize what I think we landed on for the overall proposal is one, the overall intent to manage other species, lands, and the regional plan and the goals and policies. Uh, two, we develop um, this gap analysis for where concerns that have not yet risen to the level of becoming a threshold standard live in terms of that process of becoming a threshold standard. And then uh, third, a regional plan policy that says we look at the entire structure, including what is a threshold standard, as we make decisions and as we update policy, um, as new information arises out of the subject matter working groups um, that are working on those, or at least every four years as part of the threshold evaluation. More than three. No, that was three. Okay, tell me. Three, three of the last, there's. They were long. There's both. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Sorry, to summarize, there are, there's three actions for the overall proposal. Okay. And then there's three steps in the final action. Okay, so the three overall is ongoing. We catch the, things. Nope, sorry. The the three overall is, so the, the first question, where do things like Asian clams, the intent to ma manage okay. Asian clams, where does that intent live? Okay. That lives in the goals and policies of the regional plan. Okay. That's one. Uh, two is we develop a gap analysis for those things like Asian clams 
to say to the public and to others, when will this be a threshold standard? And it, you know, this outlines when X, Y, Z are addressed. And, and how does that, where does that live? Is it a policy in, under a goal? Or? We didn't say where that lived at all. Oh, okay. We'll have to figure out where it lives. And then third, we, a regional plan, a separate regional plan policy around uh, probably in the implementation section of the regional plan that says that when we reevaluate the information mm -hmm. and we say we evaluate it in real time okay. as, as we ask the APC and governing board to make decisions, okay. we evaluate it um, as new information arises out of the subject matter working groups of the EIP. Um, and third, at least every four years as it pertains to what is or what should be a threshold standard. Would it be appropriate to reference, I guess in this instance, the AIS coordinating committee in steps one and two? I guess I wanna make sure the public doesn't see, have this perception that TRPA has this structure that is going like, we intend to do all these things when there's a whole group of dedicated professionals who meet on a regular basis that are doing that, right? And so, um, I just want to make sure that there is there is a linkage between those, uh, and you mentioned that in the tail end, right, in the third step as far as um, subject matter working groups, but like those groups exist. And so in terms of the intent to address as well as guide, prioritize, and fund the gaps analysis, all of that is going to fall through. And correct me, Dennis, but like that's all going to run through the AIS coordinating committee. Well, there may be issues that come up that aren't there, like that coverage one I just mentioned that came up through uh, housing stuff. So I think we ought to write it broad enough. That, but in this instance, if we're talking about aquatic and species. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, <laughs> right. I'm talking more on broader. Obviously. Sure, sure, broadly. But again, like it, I think in most in most instances, there are subject matter working oh, groups yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. there probably is one for, you know, coverage that will address it. So, yeah, again, I, I guess I just yeah. want to, like, we're putting a lot of time and energy in making sure those working groups are functional, organized, and effective in terms of addressing these issues and feeding things up to decision makers where appropriate. And so making that linkage to this larger process that you're laying out to uh, capture the things that aren't thresholds mm -hmm. makes sense. I, I, I want to see it be as inclusive as possible. So our stuff, the formal things we have to do, we have to do thresholds and regional plan and both right compact so those things actually live and breathe and change based on what's going on with all that other stuff 100 percent. because it's kind of been sort of separate okay. Okay. Pat, you want to close this out who me yeah well i just had a question um and i think this is getting at what john is saying like does this process now or what you're kind of outlining does this apply to all thresholds all groups um, are we, you know, like I think about the forced health thresholds have not been updated. Um, I think about a gaps analysis that they would have to undergo, um, and how this would then kind of reverberate down through all of the working groups. And then I'm wondering, you know, we do this every four years, um, you have your threshold evaluation, and then you also are examining like what's missing or is what's right to be a threshold now. Is that coming from the work group up? Is that coming from boards and commissions down into the work groups? Um, Cause I'm just wondering, like, I think about, you know, force health is obviously where my brain always wants to go. I think about, you know, different things pop up at different times um, that are, that catch, you know, attention. So then is it like, oh, well, today's hot topic is evacuation corridors and evacuation planning. We should create a threshold around that. Like, I'm just trying to think of how this cascades down into the system of all the thresholds and all the groups. I have the same concern, Kat, because I'm looking at this and going, oh, there's a new gap analysis work program item. I, so I don't think that's actually a new item. Because if it comes from the process Bob's talking about, that's great. But yeah, I was gonna say I actually think it, the gap analysis is just formalizing things that we already know in this regard. Okay. And so I would say in answer to Kat's question, it is like we've created a structure that works both works both ways, where either the working groups can push things up or things can be requested down from on high. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I think of the gap analysis and specifically related to forest health, you know, I think we've got the means to achieve a new forest health threshold. And if, you know, if we were trying to explain to the public why we haven't adopted one yet, even though we've gone through multiple iterations of the proposal within this group, it really is this question around the data related to how you want to measure it. So if you're imagining that gap analysis for forest health, we'd say we've got the means to do it. We've got the overall intent. We think it's regionally important and we still want to figure out how to measure it. And that's where we're stuck. And actually it becomes a way to better explain why updates are coming forward when they are, because it does speak to the ripeness of each of the individual pieces. And not, you know, maybe it then becomes a way to move these forward, you know, through those working groups and say, you know, it provides a gentle nudge that like, maybe we don't need to be perfect with the data we're using. Contrast that with the gaps analysis for non-native fish, right? Like we don't know the extent, the types that we're like, well, there, there's very little data on what's out there as far as like, like there's a, an infinite number of questions regarding, yeah, abundance, distribution and control that would require countless scientific analyses, right? Um, so yeah, the term gap analysis seems to be very flexible in this instance. Am I reading that correctly? Where is, I think where is it's that room, but I think it refers to the same thing. Okay, so like it, we've it, talked about it, it's a it, it's a broad concept. The gaps analysis it is everything from the data necessary to implement the forest threshold that we already know what we want to do to we don't actually know. What we well, want doesn't to it do. need to be within the scope and scale of something that would be associated or affiliated with a management action? That's well, kind of where I think I'm going. It's like, where does this live? It's, a, it's not a, it's not a standalone thing, right? It's, it's like if the, the working group's working on forest health, they say, sure. Part of the work. I'm just trying to imagine that member of the public. Like, what are you doing about the mud snap? Well, we need to do a gap analysis, or you know, whatever it is, right? Like, like that that term of gap analysis in that instance is well, we're. <laughs> Doing additional monitoring to understand their locations and working with partners to understand different control measures and trying to implement additional uh, prevention and practices and just to prevent the work or this. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that all goes down in the working group. Like, I think the That's gap is actually right. just like five things on a checklist. Like, okay. do you have information on the baseline of where we stand today? Yeah. Have you set a goal? No, okay. Sir. So you're getting you know, as much as a high level. It's super high level. Yeah. I mean, I think to, you know, like Susan's initial point with it is like, this is a tool to explain to the public why we are updating some things and why we have not yet updated yeah. others. So it really is this high level thing that says. Checklist. Yeah, it's a checklist of like baseline information, specific and measurable target, means to achieve that target. And again, I don't know, maybe there's one other thing. And yeah. that's it. So help help me get around my mental blocks. Um, one mental block, you say we, we're gonna go in and update the regional plan to put in the intent for certain things that we don't have enough to have a data driven threshold. So I get that. That's some amendments to the regional plan. Yep. And then we're gonna evaluate either in real time or as it comes out of one of these working groups or someplace else, or at least every four years we're gonna evaluate what we need to. Do we need to change a threshold or goal policy, whatever? That's a process. I see how that happens. Yep. I don't see how the is the gap analysis something separate or is it part of this process, one of these processes? I, I just don't want to end up going. Somebody saying, well, you said you were going to do a gap analysis. Where is it? I think the, the gap analysis lives at now is just a summary of what those working groups are doing that is actually, in my mind, very simple and straightforward. Relative I'm trying to get my head around. Uh, yeah, so I think it's the gap and it's literally just a row with like that we could probably pull from the existing AIS management plan that lists all the AIS in the region relative to the action agenda and then says, does it have a baseline? And it's either a green check box or a red X. Does it have a, a goal? Do we have a plan to reach is that, that goal with feasible is, methods? Is that something this committee will do once a year or something? I think it lives down in the AIS committee of where they are in terms of the process. Right. Because it's something, you know, like, so going back to the initial memo that they produced, it's it's actually referenced in there okay. and says, you know, like, when we have a viable control method, 
for Asian clams, we're going to bring you an Asian clam threshold standard. The tool they use to decide to elevate something. Yep. Okay. Does so that make sense? Yeah, I just didn't want somebody to say, oh, now we're going to do this gap analysis report every year. And a year from now, you go, where is it? <laughs> that's, yeah. That's I do like to do things. Yeah. But, you know. and, and I wouldn't I wouldn't propose that this gap analysis has to be done on every single media that has or doesn't have a threshold, right? Because you know, even James um at the beginning tied it back to, you know, those what is it, five items in the compact. Um, and noise was one of them. Uh, if nobody's actively working on noise right now, we don't necessarily have to analyze the thresholds for noise and do a gap analysis on noise. We're just okay. we're it's almost like AIS is a little bit of a pilot. <laughs> see how this works, see how it identifies priorities. You know, if we have a potential threshold that's just one step away, do we throw everything we've got at that and get it over the edge versus yeah. one that has, you know, five gaps and is just too far out there to worry about, but we'll talk about it again at the next four year review. Um, yeah. You know, it sounds like uh, forest is one of those that's so close. <laughs> um, but And being able to communicate how close that is and how maybe just a little bit more, um, you know, push by whoever, you know, money push, science push, right. a technology push, whatever that is, it can help us to prioritize those things. But um, I, I didn't go into this discussion as it evolved thinking that it would just become this massive, white paper project okay. to do gap analysis on everything that's out there. So so when we come back to the APC in a couple of months or whatever it is that I said this morning we would do, um, we, we have really two recommendations outside of these specific thresholds that you guys talked about. One is we go back and look at the regional plan and put in intent statements where we have thresholds that aren't really ready in for thresholds. Yeah. Okay. And then we also have a second recommendation that is we have three ways to evaluate the need to change thresholds. One is real time. One is as new info comes from the working groups or whoever. And the third one is at least every four years we look at it in threshold update. So is that because I'm I'm trying to address Susan's question across the whole spectrum, not just AIS or not just forest health or something. Like that. So yeah, I mean that's right. Okay, cool. Well, Everyone good with that? Steve, you just came on off on video. Did you want to jump in? Yes, uh, just to say that I'm following along and I. Really appreciate the discussion and the direction relative to how we answer those who think we know all at all times and are able to respond to some of the comments that we've been getting at APC and and the governing board, et cetera. So um, I think uh, you know, good work on that. We we don't know what we don't know, and we need to be honest about what we don't know and have a process of getting there, how however long that might take, rather than trying to pretend we know something we don't, because that actually makes the public comment even more suspicion oriented. That's my thought. Well said, James, did you want the final word before we moved on? So you come on video as well. Uh, I appreciate the discussion and it's always a question when it comes up, what I, I try to tell individuals is first we have to be able to identify the problem, we have to quantify the problem and is a solution actually attainable within the resources that are available. And that's just kind of where I'm going to leave it. That sounds like the three columns of our gap analysis. On make, that note, make sure that shows up in the governing board recommendation. No, oh, <laughs> I'm going to share my screen again and move on to the second question that arose during uh, APC. Let's see. Actually, Dan, I have one question about the keys one. Before. We're about to go into the keys one. Or... Oh, we are. Okay. Never mind. I'll wait. Oh, okay. You sure? Well, maybe see if I hit it.
All right. So why, the second question was related to the keys one, and hopefully this was your question, Jennifer, but the question was, why did we include 2045 in the keys uh, standard? Um, and so just a little history on this one. So the initial proposal um, for the threshold standard um, for the keys actually was, as you can see it on here, it was drawn directly from the action agenda. And this dates back to, shoot, I think 2021. Dennis, you may need to correct me. Um, and we initially wrote it exactly how it was written here in terms of the desired outcome from the action agenda. By 2030, we wanted a 90% re reduction um, in the plant population within the Keys. Um, and as we started working through the AIS um, coordinating committee, um, they basically said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like we have actually progressed since um, we wrote the action agenda into the controlled methods test within the Tahoe Keys. And what we now think is that it's a 70% a reduction or 75% reduction um, is the feasible reduction. Um, so let's update with that. And then I said, okay, well, what about the date? Can we still use 2030? Um, and the, the group said, no, I don't think we can use 2030 because we're, we've still got, so as of now, we've got one more year of the methods test and then we need to begin planning um, for full implementation within the keys, assuming that the methods test um, works out well. Um, and then this is sort of my mea culpa in terms of why 2045 was inserted, but, but it was in the absence of a, a new strategy to hit a goal and a deadline, we said, well, we're using a 20 year planning horizon um, for this. That's the instruction that we gave the working groups. What do you think you can accomplish within 20 years? That's, you know, it's because we didn't want indefinite time horizons for it. Um, and we just adopted the new VMT thresholds, which was on the heels of the RTP, um, which suggested 2045. So we said, wouldn't it be nice and symmetrical to have alignment there and just use 2045 here as well? Um, and I think, you know, in reality, that was probably a mistake. Um, and I guess what we're proposing today is that in the absence of such a plan, and such a plan meaning the, the plan that actually lays out the steps needed to achieve the threshold standard and the timeline um, to implement those actions, that it's inappropriate to actually adopt a standard that's just the erroneous recommendation of a bureaucrat like me sitting in an office. Um, and so we are, we're, we're no longer recommending that we include that because we don't actually have the plan to accomplish it. And we think it sends the wrong message to just send that those dates erroneously. Um, the other uh, recommended edit that we're making is that in the version that was sent to the APC, the APC, um, also a question, and Jennifer, you said you were looking through the notes, why we were referencing species when we actually meant plant abundance. Um, and so we're proposing to make that edit as well to clarify the intent of the standard. Um, and so you can see those two edits um, presented on your screen in red line form. Um, and that's really all I had on this second one. Um, so I will stop there unless someone wants me to leave I think the red line changes are fairly simple and the proposed new language is included in your packet. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen and open it up to broader discussion about whether people are comfortable um, with that recommendation or those, those recommended changes. And I'll just add for context, this, the action agenda was uh, finalized prior to our um, final documentations uh, that were completed for the keys control methods test project. So while 90% was a target for the lake as a whole, I believe even that first slide Dan showed uh, that it excluded the Tahoe keys. Uh, but in any case, the 
the keys process hadn't really begun yet. Uh, so this action agenda was uh, ahead of that. And so this is an opportunity to um, clarify or uh, make more accurate uh, what our goals and objectives are for the keys. Thank you. Appreciate the clarification. Susan. So I've been on water quality with the keys since 2016, and this has been a really ongoing process. And I think, and Dennis can hopefully support me on this. We've had, I think, incredible results over the last two years of the controlled methods test with one year still remaining. And at, at this point, could I just share a screen? Let's see, would it work or no? It should work. Do you see that? Mm. We can see it here in the room. Okay, so you know this this is a picture that goes back to 2018 as far as biomass is concerned that was in the keys before we started the controlled methods test. It also shows the uh, this unfortunately was a bit of a drought year, which means the water's warmer than normal and shallower than normal, so you do have more infestation of the plants. Um, then uh, a year later, where the water was just a little bit higher, quite a bit of the infestation did go away a bit. However, still wasn't perfect. This last slide shows what it was like in 2022 and 2023. Now, 2022 was the year that in this section here, we over to the left, we did the herbicide tests. And you can see that it really knocked out over 90% of the plants. And this was the other slide 2023 shows that, okay, pretty much where we had used the herbicides, it stayed low. And over here where we were using the uh, UV, it, we were all able to knock out more of the plants. So my point in showing you that is only that we now know that we are capable of managing the plants. Let's see, do that. okay, managing the plants in the Keys. And therefore the timeline of 2045 uh, to me was just unacceptable because we can do it before then. And we don't want the people in the Keys to think that well, for the next 20 years, we're gonna to have to be going through this consistently in order to get the now 75% reduction. Um, everybody, I've talked to the other people on the Water Quality Committee, and they are very happy with this turn. They feel that this is something that is achievable, and they also feel that uh, it would give us a much better public appearance uh, to the, basin if people didn't feel that this was something that's going to be dragging on for another 20 years. So my statement. Thank you, Susan. Jennifer. Um, that was fantastic, Susan. Thanks for those time scale pictures. Um, and, and it gets to my question um, actually about this threshold that's being proposed in relationship to the SMART criteria, because um, I was thinking abundance or 75% reduction in acreage, because I'm spatial, but um, the term biomass has come up. So in SMART criteria, how are we measuring it? Where is abundance defined and how do we know when we've gotten to 75% reduction in abundance? What does abundance mean to everyone? Yeah, we have a uh, very, complex process, I don't say complex, but a process to, uh, we well, long story, we take rake poles and then there's a process to assess all of those different rake poles to come up with a uh, bio volume reduction. Uh, so it's more about bio volume, biomass is more about how much it weighs. Uh, so we wanna try to capture the space it takes up. So that's both linearly and vertically. Thank you, that helps. And just a little bit of additional context there, Jennifer, the, the AS coordinating committee was concerned. I think we started with an acreage target as well. Um, and they were concerned that they, you'd get more credit for treating the sparse acres 
that we actually care about less than tackling the really hard acres that were dense infestations. And so they shifted from an acreage based target to an abundance based target to encourage treatment of those, yeah, out of the really nasty sections, if you will. Uh, I would just, I have a couple of questions. I mean, one, I think that what Susan showed was was great. Um, I think a lot of that is with BioBase, and I think that would be a great tool to assess um, abundance as well, and that's what they're utilizing on the TKPOA side um, to kind of measure that. Um, what I would ask with, um, you know, reducing aquatic invasive plant abundance in the Keys, um, I'm just not sure if it should also be reduced and then somehow maintain um, mm -hmm. that level. Um, and then if you say reduce by 75%, are we coming up with um, that as the baseline for the next say, you know, the threshold evaluation and it goes for 75 from that 75, if you understand my, my meaning there, like if we reduce abundance by 75%, then do we, at some point, if we have achieved that, do we maintain that 75% reduction or are we trying to reduce that next level another 75%, so to speak. 75% of what baseline? <laughs> yes, of what baseline? Are we talking 2022 baseline? Are we talking like uh, Valentine's Day today baseline? What what baseline are we, we operating off of in order to um, appropriately determine the 75% reduction and yeah, again, is that achieve and maintain? Is that achieve and then additionally achieve? I just, I want to make sure that we are intentionally clear on, on what that means specifically. Yeah, and Dennis, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the initial year of the uh, uh, controlled methods test was to reduce the or to re, to reduce the amount of biomass by 75% and then be able to maintain it by non-chemical purposes. Um, I don't think that there's in, once we main, reduce by the 75% and as we proved we actually in the area where we use the herbicides we actually reduce by about 95% and we're trying to maintain that. Um, I don't think it means every year we have to re, uh, we have to go down by another seventy five percent. Dennis, am I correct? That that's correct. Yeah, we would have to have a baseline, which in uh, from uh, metrics for the test itself, we would be using the twenty nineteen or twenty twenty data uh, to control uh, to compare against, as well as the controls that are within uh, the methods test as well the controls locations. I, I suppose what I am suggesting is that we utilize reduce and maintain language and establish what the baseline is. Dennis, can we add a baseline year for the rest of the keys? Yes. Yeah, I would support that. I would want to look, I want to check what the right year should be if it's 2019 or 2020 based on the holistic okay. monitoring that we did ahead of implementation. Okay. Um, and I'm okay with not having, you know, a specific deadline that was expressed by, by TKPOA and some of our control methods test meetings, but I do want to make sure that we are revisiting that on a somewhat regular basis, like we should be with the rest of the threshold um, yeah. as we kind of move forward with that in terms of, you know, what's achievable and adaptive management while also keeping these strong, um, even though I know this is sort of smart, not without the T, so we don't have the timeline now for this one. Just ask a clarifying question on the proposed threshold. Is it if you're getting 95%, can you be consistent with the threshold if you go down to 75% or 70, whatever the, the goal is, or is it a non-degradation you know, 
standard in effect. Does that make sense or am I? Uh, yes, it makes sense. I think that uh, we were quite surprised that we got the 95% knockdown, realizing that with the herbicides, they're species specific. So even though we were getting rid of the Asian milfoil, the coontail, uh, it was not affecting some of the other native species like the uh, Aladea. So, you know, we wouldn't get rid of that. And then the question is, can we maintain the waterways so that the native species do remain and it makes a very natural habitat for the, the fish, et cetera. And we kind of keep uh, the invasive species out by various methods. Um, problem with the UV is it's killing everything, even the productive plants. So, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting after the third year to see in what direction the uh, community wants to go as far as what, what's, what's next. Do we, are we going to be able to use the herbicides again? Are we going to have to just totally maintain by non-chemical uh, method methodology and um, Dennis probably knows more than me about that. No, well, and these are also just moments in time. So that's not to say that that ninety five percent can or could be uh, maintained in a longer time frame. There's lots of different factors at play, especially this year with high water, uh, where uh, you just didn't have ideal growing conditions. So plants didn't aren't as abundant as they were in previous years due to a combination of, of factors. So we want to, certainly if we think we can maintain a higher standard, I think we would want to address that over the course of the every four years of evaluating threshold. And if there's opportunities to then uh, state we are confident that we can achieve a, a higher bar, then we could certainly make those updates at the time. But I think a 75%, even though we're seeing some 95% now, uh, is is more reasonable, at least at this point. Were you referring to if we achieve 75% and then we don't maintain that, if that would be considered backsliding or anti? No, I think that... I'm sorry, too. too. No, no, no. no. Um, I think that falls within you have to achieve and maintain thresholds within the yeah. compact re requirement. I'm talking about what happens if you find that you can achieve 95%. Got it. I wasn't sure if you were flipping the script. So no. Got it. Jennifer. So not to throw a monkey wrench in it, but um, we did change aquatic invasive species to plants. Um, and we are talking about the plants that we've all been discussing for years. We're not talking about algae, cyanobacteria, well, which isn't a plant, it's a bacteria, but <laughs> uh, Correct. we're There's... not talking about al algae blooms, right? Yeah, correct. We're talking about three target organisms, okay. the Eurasian water milfoil, curly leaf pondweed, and coontail. I would also suggest there's sort of a parallel with uh, 75 or what if we achieve 95? Think about that to the SEZ threshold standard where an initial goal was set and then the basin it decided it wanted to do more because it was achieving the initial goal. So, you know, you appear, we appear at 95, we maintain that for years on end. Presumably, that the recommendation comes up in the AS coordinating committee that. The revised goal, or the right, excuse me, the revised threshold standard should actually be 95% reduction because that's where we believe we can maintain it. Okay. So, please. So, to further confuse this or cause a problem. What would be wrong with then the re reduced aquatic invasive plant abundance in the Tahoe Keys by a minimum of 75 years based upon the base year that, of course, Dennis would provide of either 2019 or 2020 based upon a five-year rolling average? Because you're not saying we only care about the year 2045 when we get there. I assume you're trying to figure out, you understand what I'm trying to figure out is how do we put in there to the general public or the people reading this? that we're not trying to reduce it by at least 75% uh, 
of the 2019 number by the year 2045. We're trying to create a, I would assume a rolling average that would be, would get us there or we would maintain. Yeah, it's you know, be really hard to answer that question now because we don't know what methodologies are gonna be available to us in the future. And that, that right now would affect how much of a knockdown we could get in subsequent years. You know, you're going to have less of a knockdown if you're having to use all diver-assisted uh, uh, hand pull versus whether or not you're going to be able to wipe out everything by using species-specific herbicides. And that's going to be a three-year process to determine just what we're going to be allowed to do based on having to do a new EIR, EIS. And whether or not certain individuals will let you use those, the most effective tools available. I understand what you're saying, yeah. Okay. So they, and we are talking about removing the 2045 date. So it would just be reduce AIS abundance in the Tahoe Keys by a minimum of 75% from a 2019 slash 2020 baseline, depending on guidance. And I think we've generally not put reduce and maintain because the, the compact requires maintenance for achieving and maintaining. So we've used one, but I defer to legal counsel about whether we need reduce and maintain. No, we do not need it. Okay. It's inherent in setting a threshold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it, it applies to your question, Director. So it applies in perpetuity going forward unless the board adopts a new threshold standard. Okay. Thank you. I think the evaluation process would then be the correct mechanism for changing that it, at yeah. some point if we update the baseline. Which could okay. be at least every four years. Yes, without, without more. It doesn't come from a subject matter expert. So. And the director's question or comment triggered a question in my mind, I guess, because what is the um, what's the the time bound uh, time frame on uh, doing that assessment of seventy five percent minimum seventy five percent reduction? Is it annually or is it every four years? Is it an average, like a, like you said, a five year average? Some some years you might be at ninety percent. Some years, you know, we have an abundance of growth and we can't keep up with it, and it's down at, you know, sixty eight percent. Is is uh, what's the frequency of analysis to uh, to determine um, achievement of the threshold? Is it? It seems like it might be four years as a single number. Dennis, do you have thoughts on writing in like a multi-year average as the assessment criteria? Or is it premature to do so? Premature, because I'm not sure how we would do it um, necessarily. Um, I, I want to think more about that and talk to our consultants as well that are doing the monitoring work. Yeah, this is James Settlemeyer. Sorry to interrupt, but I would be totally fine leaving that within your purview. But I would want to try to figure out because some years, as was mentioned earlier by Susan, if you have a very dry year and you have shallow water, you have warmer temperatures, or if you have an extremely hot year, you're going to have more uh, bloom per se of invasive species versus a cold year and a wet year. And so I'd hate to try to get mired in keeping it on a single year. That's where I like the idea of an average better, whatever you're most comfortable with, in order to try to be able to get these numbers, because sometimes people are too focused at the day, today. Well, this year is terrible. Well, you have to look at all the other mitigating factors versus, you know, other years are easier to obtain. Uh, it's just, I don't know, something to think about. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't really thinking about it in that context. That provides uh, a better explanation for me, so thank you. I Yes, I think we could... Um, put it in an average perspective. And, and that's exactly and what's done with the um, the TMDL. There's a five-year rolling average because we all go through the drama every few years of, oh my God, clarity was terrible. Like, yeah, but the five-year average is still, we're still okay. It's just, it was the lake turned over this year. So we're going to, we're going to be all right. So. Still want to talk it through just to make sure I'm not not thinking of something, uh, but 
on the face of it, I think that makes sense. So the the language that I was sort of jotting down, which is I think I guess contingent on you bringing it back to the AS coordinating committee, Dennis, for consideration is reduce average AS abundance in the Tahoe Keys by a minimum of seventy five percent from the XX baseline. Yeah. Okay. And this is for the Tahoe Keys as a whole, correct? Including the, the TPM side. Okay. Yeah. This is. Other thoughts? Are people comfortable with that? Thumbs up. Excellent. That was um, the last point of discussion for today. So you have the last eight minutes back for whatever else you'd like to do. Appreciate the time all. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate the feedback and input. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. A good meeting as always. Thank you. Thank you.